Oh, hi there. I wasn't actually reading this. My name's Forrest. I'm a biologist and I make educational science videos on the internet. Not too long ago, I made a TikTok video about what it means to be trans or intersex. And ever since that day, I've been tagged in about a thousand different videos of people making the same stupid arguments that we've all heard a million times. Things like, oh, you're either XX or XY, or boys act like this and girls look like that, or you can't change your gender any more than you can change your age or your species. And I figured that I could make a bunch of different TikTok videos, each one trying to cram into 60 seconds just how asinine these arguments actually are, or I could just make one solid YouTube video that explains in layman's terms how this whole two-gender system works, or doesn't work from a biological perspective. Before we begin, however, we're gonna need to get a few things straight. First of all, humans are animals. We are living things, and we are not plants, and we are not fungi, and we are not bacteria. We are animals, and we obey the same laws of nature as every other animal. I'm throwing this in here right at the outset because I want to try to avoid the insane argument that we are somehow special or have some privileged place in this world. We're not, and we don't. Second of all, throughout the course of this video, I'm going to be arguing against the binary model of things like sex and gender, but I'm still going to use terms like male and female and girl and boy. This is just for the sake of convenience. If I were to make a long-form argument like this and have special language for the whole thing, this video would be unwatchable, so I'm counting on you to be able to follow along. You're also going to need to understand some pretty basic biological terminology, so I'm going to run through a very quick vocab list for you. If you don't want to sit through that, just jump to this part of the video but I strongly encourage that everybody stick around because this might help avoid some confusion later on. Cells are the most fundamental unit of life. In fact, they're the smallest things that we can call alive. Your body is made of lots and lots of cells of all sorts of different shapes and sizes that all do different things. DNA is the instruction manual that your body uses to do most things, mainly just making proteins. You have DNA in almost every single cell in your body. A long stretch of DNA that codes for one particular thing is called a gene, and a bunch of DNA, a bunch of genes, all squished together and coiled up into a little wad is called a chromosome. Humans have 46 chromosomes that are broken up into 23 pairs. You get 23 from your dad and 23 from your mom. Each pair does pretty much the same thing. By the way, fun fact, if you were to take all of the DNA out of just one of your cells, all 46 chromosomes, unwind them all and stretch them out end to end, it would be about as long as me, a little over six feet long. And that's just in one cell! Another term that you're going to want to know is the term dimorphic. Di means two, morph means shape, so dimorphism is the state of having two different shapes. This is what we call it whenever a species has differently shaped males and females. And in case you want to know, the term for having males and females in the first place is called being dioecious. A monoecious species only has one sex, a dioecious species has two. I'm probably going to use quite a few more terms throughout the video, but I'll try to explain those as I go along. I don't want to give you like a whole word bank here, so let's get started with the concept of what sex actually is. In biology, sex is not just the term for the act of reproduction through gene blending. It's also the term for how we characterize and categorize males versus females. And in the world of biology, your sex is determined by the size of your reproductive cells, which we call your gametes. If you have lots and lots of very small little gametes, we call those sperm and you're a boy. If you have relatively few very large gametes, we call those eggs and you're a girl. Now right away, you can notice that there's a pretty big problem here. What if you don't have any gametes? What if you're infertile? Does that mean that you're neither male nor female? The thing that you have to understand about biology is that all we're trying to do is define and calculate what nature is already doing all on its own. Life makes all the rules and breaks all the rules all the time. So as biologists, our job is to try to just carve out a hole for the peg that nature has already given us, and not everybody's going to fit into that slot. The point is, the definition of sex is not unique here. There is almost always some wiggle room, some gray area, in almost every single biological definition of anything. It's one of the reasons I became a biologist, because life is weird as shit. So yeah, the fact that I just gave you an actual textbook definition and then immediately blew a big hole in it should give you a pretty good idea of how the rest of this video is going to go. Ignoring the fact that an individual of a dioecious species might not have any gametes at all, the fact that we base sex on gamete size in the first place raises a lot of serious concerns. There are several species that are dioecious, they have males and females, but their gametes are all the same size. They differentiate into what we call mating types, which you could call like male and female, but the only thing that you'd be going off of there is who's giving and who's receiving the gametes. And if we tried to define everybody that way, then things like seahorses would have their sexes swapped because the females deposit the eggs into the males, and then the males fertilize them and give birth to live young. 
Also, there are a few species that have more than just two gamete sizes. For example, there's one species of fruit fly that has one size of egg and then three different sizes of sperm, each produced by a different type of male. So we should really be saying that there are four different sexes here, or at the very least we could say that there's two sexes, but one of them is broken down into three subclasses of male, one of which violates the whole definition of sex anyway because their sperm is actually bigger than the female's egg. By the way, in case you were curious, here's some bonus vocab words for you. The term for when a species has more than one size of gamete is anisogamy. The term for having just one size of gamete is isogamy. So if you wanted to sound all smart and important, you could say that humans are a dioecious, anisogametic, and moderately sexually dimorphic species of primates. Also, the whole idea that you're just born male or female and that we should just go with what's on your birth certificate is deeply flawed, to say the least. There are several species that are completely hermaphroditic, making both sperm and eggs. There are several species that are sequentially hermaphroditic. They start out as either male or female, and then later on in life, they switch. There are plenty of species that can be one sex their entire lives, and then when it comes time to breed, if they can't find the opposite sex around, they just switch to the opposite sex to help everybody else out. There are even some animals that we call bilateral gonandromorphs that are literally male on one half of their body and female on the other half. You can even have that whole setup just in your gonads. Ovotestes are when you have ovarian tissue on one side and testicular tissue on the other side of the same organ. That happens sometimes in humans and other animals, and there are even some species where that's the normal ground state of all females. So gonadal differences aren't enough to actually differentiate between the two sexes. But I know what you're thinking, right? You're thinking, hey, just look at the chromosomes. After all, you're either XX or XY, right? Not exactly. The concept of how sex is determined in an organism is usually broken down like this. You have your chromosomes, those code for what kind of gonads you get, either ovaries or testes, and then those produce germ cells and hormones, and that's how we tell whether you're a boy or a girl. And if you go to any high school level biology class, that's probably the explanation that you're going to get. Problem is, that's wildly inaccurate, and it leaves a lot of stuff out. First of all, the sex of an embryo is evident well before gonads ever develop. In fact, there are plenty of species where external genitalia develop before gonads ever do. There are also plenty of chromosomal sex differences that have nothing to do with genitalia or gonads or any of that, and therefore don't fall into that whole biological gamete size sex determining model, but are still very important. For example, the human Y chromosome contains instructions for a special kind of ribosome, which is the part of the cell that builds proteins. So protein synthesis is just very slightly different in me than it is for any female, and it has been since well before I had any hint of a gender. Perhaps you have heard that we are all females by default, and that it's the Y chromosome that makes me into a boy. That ain't true either. It is true to say that one particular gene on the Y chromosome, what we call SRY, plays a pretty important role in the development of testes and therefore by extension male behavior. So for example, when the SRY gene was spliced into XX female mice, about 30% of them developed male testes, male genitalia, and even male behaviors. Similarly, when the SRY gene was cut out of XY male mice, many of them went on to develop ovaries, to develop feminine behaviors, and even to be able to get pregnant and have litters. Again, those are XY male mice getting pregnant and giving birth. But don't let any of this fool you into thinking that like the SRY gene is some magical on-off switch masculinity. The truth is way weirder and way cooler than that. For example, there was one cool study done back in the 1980s that showed that like female wallabies with XX chromosomes that didn't have any egg cells at birth actually developed testes and went on to be more or less males even without the SRY gene. And you know why? It's because everyone has the genes for both testes and ovaries. What kind of gonads you get, whether it's one or the other or neither or both, comes down to an incredibly complex set of genetic interactions on several different chromosomes, a few of which aren't even your sex chromosomes. For example, the gene that builds testes is called SOX9, and it's on chromosome number 17, which everyone watching this has. If you have ovaries right now, that's because on your X chromosome you have another gene called NR0B1, which makes a protein called DAX1 that stops SOX9 from giving you testes. But I have an X chromosome too, right? So like, what's going on there? The SRY gene that we've been talking about works by producing a protein that binds to NR0B1 and stops it from making DAX1 so that SOX9 can give me testes. That's why I have testicles. It's because a gene made a protein that stopped another gene from making a different protein that would have otherwise stopped a different gene from giving me the testicles that I have. If you're paying attention, you might be starting to notice a few things here. This means that you could have a totally perfectly functional Y chromosome, 
but you have a problem with your SOX9 gene, and so you still end up with ovaries. Or, this could mean that you have no Y chromosome at all, but you have a faulty NR0B1 gene, and so you still end up with testicles. And yes, there are other animals, even other mammals, that don't have an SRY gene, that don't have an NR0B1 gene, that are still dioecious and still have sex differentiation. And there are even other animals that have all the same chromosomes and all the same genes that we have, but then they have other genes on top of that, so the whole switch from male to female to male back to female again is even more complicated. Well, let's ignore all that. Let's say that you have all the right chromosomes and you have all the right genes in all the right places, None of that really matters, because it's the hormones that your gonads produce that actually make your body look and act male or female. All the way back in like the early 1930s, scientists were noticing that female hormones introduced into male rats were producing some decidedly male behaviors, and that similarly, male hormones introduced into female rats were making them like, weirdly more female. Even though we've been studying this stuff for like a hundred years now, a lot of people are still very surprised to find that we all have testosterone and estrogen and all the other sex hormones in our body at all times, and they don't usually do what a lot of people think they do. Let me give you just a grossly oversimplified explanation of how this works. You see, the cholesterol in your body is converted into progesterone, and then that is what becomes testosterone, and that is what gives you what my anatomy professors would call male internal plumbing. Some testosterone is converted into dihydrous testosterone, and that's what gives you male external genitalia. Some other testosterone is then converted into estrogen and estradiol, and that's where you get female secondary sex characteristics and get this, male brain anatomy. That's right, female embryos have to produce special proteins to bind estrogen to stop it from getting to their brains, otherwise they would develop mentally like a boy. We'll talk more about that stuff later. So every person has all of these hormones at different levels in their body all the time. Your exact hormone levels are as unique as your fingerprint. It's also important to note that hormones don't actually do anything. All they're able to do is bind to receptors on your cells, and then that makes the cells do the things that make you into a male or a female. And guess what? The production of those cell receptors is controlled by a totally different gene pathway. So for example, you could have a daughter who still hasn't had her period by like 16. So you take her to the doctor to figure out what's going on and you find out that your daughter is actually your son who has androgen insensitivity syndrome. So their cells aren't producing the receptors to bind testosterone. So even though they've got enough testosterone in their body to give them freaking antlers and a mane, they still look and feel like a girl. Couple of other important notes about sex chromosomes. Females tend to have XX chromosomes, but that second X doesn't really do much. It tends to just shrivel up, and only about 15% of it is actually expressed at any given time. And whether it's the first or the second X totally varies from cell to cell. You could literally have two cells right next to each other, one of them expressing the first X chromosome, the other one expressing the second X chromosome. Conversely, the Y chromosome mainly codes for male-specific biochemistry and functionality, things like the special ribosomes that I talked about earlier, as well as things like sperm production. But remember, these genes can only be expressed under certain conditions and in certain parts of the body. So like, for example, that sperm production gene is only ever going to be expressed in the testes. If I don't have testes because of one of the other genetic variations that we talked about a minute ago, this gene does nothing. Even if you have the gene, even if you have the whole chromosome, you could still be missing any one of five different pieces of the puzzle of what sex determination actually is. Oh, and by the by, literally everything that I just said is completely reversed in birds. Birds don't have XY, they have ZW, and it's the boys that are homogenous in their chromosomes. So they have ZZ, and the girls have ZW, and they have to go through the complicated back and forth gene pathway just to stay girls. And don't even get me started on dioecious versus monoecious plants, man, because they're even weirder. There are lots of different species that don't have any differences in their sex chromosomes at all. They have totally different ways of establishing and differentiating their sexes. Like, for example, there are lots of species of turtles and lizards and fish where sex is determined not by chromosomes, but by the temperature of their eggs. So you have a female leopard gecko. She lays her eggs in a cool, shady spot. All of the babies are going to be female. But if she lays them in a warm, sunny spot, all of the babies will be male, unless it gets too warm and then they switch back over to female, but they're incredibly aggressive, and we call those hot females because herpetologists are not very imaginative. And it's really, really important to point out that when we're talking about these long genetic pathways, where any one step along the way could take us way off track, what we're talking about are variations. Not anomalies, not deformities, not defects, 
variations, and there's a huge difference. Over the years, I've studied in a lot of anatomy labs, and I've dissected a lot of human cadavers, as well as other animals, and we see variations all the time. Just differences from the textbook. Little changes in how an artery branches, or how a nerve passes through a muscle, or even big things like the shape or position of a whole organ. These are classified as variations and not deformities or anomalies because they happen a lot more often than you might think, and they don't really cause any harm. They're just relatively inconsequential differences between one person and another. So my question is, is it really so hard to accept that things like sex or gender could be subject to the same kinds of variations, and that those variations would be, at most, equally inconsequential? This may shatter someone's whole worldview, but it needs to be said. In fact, if you take nothing else away from this video, I hope you understand this one point. An X or a Y chromosome is neither necessary nor is it sufficient for determining your sexual identity. There is no standard template for male versus female development in biology. And unless you have had your DNA sequenced and analyzed by a developmental biologist, you have no idea what's going on with you in this respect. As it stands, there are more than enough variations on the sex chromosomes alone to make a male that is feminine enough or a female that is masculine enough to pass as the opposite gender in both social circles and even to themselves. The language of genetics is in no way laconic or easy to decipher, and that makes it completely impossible to reduce things like sex and gender down to a binary. Gametes can be gendered in this way. Brains and bodies cannot. The point that I'm trying to make here is that even what you might call normal is a massively diverse group of people. We all live on a spectrum, and people are under no obligation to make sense to you. The other point that I'm trying to make is that we really need to stop saying things like XX equals girl. At most, we need to be saying things like people with XX are typically girls. We need to do away with all of this unnecessarily heteronormative language if we're going to ameliorate the way that our society perceives and treats gender as a whole. But to really understand what I mean by that, let's try to define gender. Gender is a fluid term and a social construct. And if you don't believe me on that, just think about this with me for a second. Can a real man wear a dress? Can a real woman fix a car? What about ordering a fruity cocktail? Who gets to do that? What about being the primary bread earner of the house? Who, who, whose job is that? When you think about it for more than two seconds, you start to realize that the way that we define gender is completely arbitrary. And it varies from generation to generation, if not from person to person. I mean, consider the fact that our traditional nursery colors of blue for boys and pink for girls was only really established in the 1940s. Before that, dressing a boy in pink would have been all the rage, but now if you ask most people, they'd say that dressing a boy in pink is like somehow obscene. The truth is that masculine and feminine really don't mean anything in concrete terms, certainly not in biological terms. Gender is just the term that we use for how an individual organism expresses their sexual identity in a cultural context. It is a reflection of that individual's expectations and the society's expectations of their behavior. And just to really drive that point home, let's take a look at a few examples to show just how fuzzy gender really is. We've talked a little bit about sexual dimorphism. There are some species where the males are bigger and stronger than the females. There are also some species where the females are bigger and stronger than the males. And then there are a lot more species that are not dimorphic at all, and so the males and females are completely indistinguishable from one another. There are also plenty of species that have three or more genders or no genders at all. There are even some species where the males take multiple forms, some of those forms resemble females. There are other species like hyenas, where the females are so indistinguishable from the males that it's really hard to tell the difference without like dissecting them because the females have a fully erectile pseudopenis. There are fruit bats in Borneo and Malaysia where the males lactate to feed the babies, and even human males have mammary glands that can be triggered to develop and even produce milk given the right circumstances, no matter what your chromosomes look like. There are lots of species where the males impregnate the females and the females give birth. There are other species where the females deposit eggs inside the male and then the male gives birth. There are some species where the males, not the females, tend to the nest and watch over the eggs. There are other species where they take turns. There are lots and lots of species that are patriarchal and the males control the group. There are lots and lots of other species that are matriarchal and the females control the group. A lot of primate species, even some of our closest relatives, are matriarchal, not patriarchal. In fact, there are several species where being a big, strong, dominant alpha male would mean no female ever mates with you. 
And as I said in the beginning of this video, humans are not special in any of this. We are just animals. The one cool thing that we've got going on for us is that we are the only animals that can communicate in great detail how it feels to have a gender. We should not be afraid of these differences between cis and trans and gay and straight or whatever. We should be excited for an opportunity to learn how life really works rather than just trying to cram everything down into boxes all the time. If we want to understand what it means to be anything, we need to focus on science and be listening to the people who are living the lives that we want to understand. And speaking of understanding, let's take a minute to talk about brains. Now, I don't have time in this video to get into like the whole anatomy and physiology of how brains work, so I'm gonna skip all that. And I'm just gonna say that there are, in fact, small structural differences between the brains of male and female humans. In other animals, these differences are big enough to be seen with the naked eye, but in humans, it's really, they're quite subtle. We're talking about clusters of neurons that are like the size of a grain of rice. These are differences that develop within a few weeks before birth to maybe a couple of years after birth. The major notable brain regions that are usually talked about in research papers on this type of thing are the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, the central subdivision of the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, and the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide containing subnucleus of the suprachiasmic nucleus. Yeah, try saying that three times fast. And here's a fun fact for you. Trans people have been consistently shown to have neural architecture in these areas that matches their gender identity not their genitalia. So for example, the BSTC is about 50% larger in men than it is in women. A trans man, so someone transitioning from female to male, has a BSTC that is the size of a cis man's. And similarly, a trans woman has a BSTC that is the size of a cis woman's. These are structural differences that cannot be accounted for with any amount of sexual reassignment surgery or any amount of hormone therapy. This is literally having a female brain trapped inside a male body, or vice versa, from birth. Incidentally, in homosexuals, that same region, the BSTC, is the perfect size for their gender, because sexual orientation and gender are two entirely different things. However, interestingly enough, the VIP SCN is actually more dimorphic. So it's smaller in females and larger in males, but in gay males, it's even larger. So it's like, they're more masculine in this way. So that's kind of cool. And speaking of homosexuality, there's clear evidence that there's a big genetic component to that as well. Back in the 1990s, there were several studies that were done that showed that if one identical twin was gay, there was up to a 65% chance that the other identical twin would be gay. But that only works in identical twins because they share the same DNA. In fraternal twins with different DNA, the chance of the other one being gay went down to around like 29% max. And in non-twin siblings, the chances went down to just the normal average for any average American, which is about 4%. All of this pretty much categorically rules out the idea that somebody can be turned gay or worse, straightened out, but it does not rule out the idea that there could be environmental factors that cause epigenetic changes that allow those genes to be expressed. These studies are super important, but they lack a lot of context, and that context can only come from people being incredibly honest with total strangers about very intimate sexual details that at the time these studies were done were very taboo. Personally, I think that if we were to run those same studies again today with our society that's a lot more open and accepting of homosexuality, and we were to factor in things like the religiosity of the person's upbringing and how accepting their family is, we would find that things like homosexuality, or at least bisexuality, are a lot more common than you might think. But that's just a supposition, so let's get back to science and wrap things up. So if you've been following along, we've covered that there are at least three different areas of the brain that are dimorphic between the sexes, and they each vary independently of one another. So that means you have two different possibilities in three different regions, so two times two times two is eight different ways that your brain could be structured between what you might call just male or just female. If you factor in what kind of gonads you have, either testes or ovaries, that's another times two. But you could also have neither, and you could also have both, so we really should be saying times four, but just for convenience sake, we'll say another times two. So that means that you have at least 16 different configurations of what you could presumably call someone's gender. And we haven't even factored in sexual orientation. You would have to make different permutations for gay, for straight, for bisexual, for pansexual, for asexual. We haven't factored in intersex people. We haven't factored in Kleinfelter syndrome where you have XXY, that's three sex chromosomes. We haven't factored in Turner syndrome where you have X and then nothing else. We haven't factored in whether you have a penis or a vagina or both or neither or more than one of one or the other, which happens from time to time. If you really, really want to push the idea 
that everybody fits into just one out of however many boxes, you are very quickly going to have to come up with dozens, if not hundreds of different categories just to fit this insanely parochial worldview you're keeping. It is so much easier just to say that things like sex and gender and sexual orientation exist on a spectrum. And while it is entirely possible that you're like 100% straight or 100% female, it's also at least equally possible that you land somewhere along this fuzzy gradient. And again, unless you have had your brain scanned and your genome sequenced, you have no idea where you land on this deeply ramified line at this very moment. And that shouldn't bother you. It should make you curious. But to go on telling people things like, you're XY and that means you're a boy and boys act like this, is not only preposterously inaccurate, it is cruel and dangerous. Which brings me to why I care. As someone who is cisgendered and at least mostly straight, you could argue that I don't have a dog in this fight. But the fact of the matter is, I am a scientist and an educator. I care about the truth. I care about human beings. And I especially care about the next generation. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people from the ages of 10 to 24. Lots of young people think about it. I thought about it at that time. But LGBT people in that age group are almost five times as likely to have attempted suicide than their heterosexual peers. And what's worse, LGBT youth who report coming from non-accepting and non-supportive families are eight times more likely than the other LGBT youth to have attempted suicide. So we're talking about eight times more likely than the people who are already five times more likely than the people who are already stressed the hell out to try to kill themselves. And all of this is hugely exacerbated by the fact that you have idiots on TV and on the internet saying, aha, this high suicide rate proves that this is all a mental disorder. No, it proves that these poor kids are being treated like perverts and freaks for just trying to exist. If the biggest problem that you're having in the 21st century is what people's genitals look like, and what they're doing with their genitals in the company of other consenting adults, if, if, if that is the needle on your moral compass, I strongly encourage you to reevaluate your priorities. And maybe you still don't believe me. Maybe you think that I've just gotten something totally wrong or that I misinterpreted the data. That's fine. I'm an evolutionary biologist and I mainly study bioanthropology. I am not a geneticist. I am not a developmental biologist. So I would hit the limit of my understanding in this topic well before I hit the limit of what there is to be understood. But I should point out that even considering that, I have not even scratched the surface of what I could have talked about here. But all that being said, as a scientist and an educator, it is my job to cite my sources. So here's a list of some of the books and the studies and the peer-reviewed scientific papers that I use to make this video that support my arguments. So I guess just read through those and get back to me. With that, I'm Forrest Valkai, the Renegade Science Teacher. Thank you so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing, and all the other things that you do here on YouTube. Have an awesome day. Be yourself. And never stop learning. Bye-bye.